Amen. Amen. If y'all would find John chapter 10 in your Bible, Scott just read for us there. On December 17, 1903, at 10.35 a.m., Orville Wright set his place in history when he executed the first powered and sustained flight from level ground. First flight from level ground. This is the beginning of flying air travel as we know it. For 12 glorious, gravity-defying seconds, he flew 120 feet along the dunes of the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Many would say that this was the beginning, rightfully so, the beginning of the aviation field. But for the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur, it was the end of what had been a very long and difficult journey to get to where they were, a journey that began with vision when they were just boys. About 15 years before that, their dad had brought home a toy that they called, they called it a helicopter, and the boys just called it a bat, and they watched how this little toy that their dad brought home would wind up and go, go across and hit the wall and, and then fall down, and they got it in their heads that they wanted to fly. And more importantly, they got it into their hearts that they wanted to fly, and it went from we want to fly to we must fly. This is something that we must do. That's called vision. When you catch something that you see and it begins to shape the reality of your future, that's, that's what vision is. Vision is a pre- preferred picture of the future and followers of Jesus Christ. That means Jesus' preferred vision for the future. And it's not that it's not just this picture of the future. It's a, it's a picture of the future that ought to motivate us. It allows us to imagine possibilities that without the vision having been given to us that we wouldn't have otherwise thought. Vision helps us to think, wow, life could actually be like that and then compel you to strive for that. Vision allows us to begin to paint that picture, not just kind of see it. So uh, vision is the difference between um, filling sandbags or filling sandbags that would be put into uh, a structure that would create a dam that would save an entire community from a flood. So if you're just filling those sandbags, who cares? But if you know you're filling those sandbags for a purpose, all of a sudden every scoop means something, and all of your efforts begin to mean something. That's the difference that that vision can make. All of us, every single person in this room is going to end up somewhere in your life. Very few people will end there on purpose. You will aim... Most people in our day and age aim at nothing and hit it every time. We are consumeristic in our thinking. We go about saying, I want, I want more stuff. I get more stuff. Didn't really pan out like I thought it would. I'll get some more stuff. Um, I'll seek these pleasures. Surely there's something I need to feel that I haven't felt yet. I'll trade in my relationships for what I feel like are better relationships. And so the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. And then you get to the end of your life. Um, your attention, what you pay attention to, what you focus on, if you have a vision for the future, you can focus on that. And your attention will determine your direction, and your direction will ultimately determine your destination. I wonder what, I wonder what is determining the direction of your life right now this morning. Because that's going to that's gonna take you to a particular destination. That's vision. It's taking you where you want to be. Uh, so given where we are as, as a church, um, and by that I mean uh, the growth that we've experienced in our, in our communities, but also experienced uh, here in our, in our church family, I think we served somewhere in the neighborhood of 850 to 900 people on, on Christmas Eve. In, uh, in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area in Texas, that's not that large of a church, but for us, that's probably about twice as many people as there were just a, a couple of years ago, given also the fact that this is a uh, transient, our communities that, that we live in, they, they move a lot, right? So it's not just that we've that we've doubled in numbers, it's that some people that were here moved and then those people were replaced and then doubled. So there's a lot of, a lot of new, we just bought land uh, for the church. We're kind of, kind of this, you know, what, what does the future look like? So I thought it would be great if I shared my vision for the church. And then I realized I don't have one and that's unfortunate. But the good news is that Jesus does. So Jesus, and I've, I have been, I came into ministry uh, vocationally in, um, in uh, a, let's say, I guess it's about 2004, 2005, and this idea of vision, and people would ask me, you know, what is your vision? And what they wanted to know was something particular about me, and I know uh, by trial and error that there's not anything real remarkable about me, 
And so I don't, I've already, I've already tried to live my vision. It took me to about age 23 and I was about dead. So I don't really think y'all want to know what my vision is. I think what we need and what we still need is, is Jesus's vision for us. And I believe that Jesus Christ has cast a vision for our lives that we need as a church and every single person. We desperately need this and we need to get on board with it. And uh, the entire world does. And if you don't, like I say this because I know looking at an audience like this, probably about, I don't know how many of y'all, but there's a percentage of y'all that won't live here in three years. You'll be in another town, another community. And, and when you're there, if you are at something that is called a church where one man has a bunch of stuff that he wants you to do, you're not joining a church. You're joining a cult. And it's a cult of personality. And he's going to be much better looking than me. And he's going to be a whole lot more charismatic than me. Had a lot more charisma than me. And he can pull you into things and you can get on board with them. But you're just getting on, on board. If it's not from God... If it's not founded in his word, you're just getting on another, getting bored on with another thing that you could have gotten on board with from your couch or some advertisement on TV or some other thing that you needed to buy into. And you're going to get to the end of it. And you're going to find yourself disappointed. However, there is a word of God. There is a savior whom we sing to and whom we sing about and we get baptized in the name of that is worth giving every ounce of our life to. Every bit of it. Uh, and I will, uh, you know, if I have time at the end of this, I'll, I'll share some, some uh, things that are like um, distinctive approaches that I feel like are, as your pastor, that I, I, I look for and things. But, it, but don't those things, those distinctives, those need to be found in Christ's vision for the people he came to save. That he bought, the, he bought the church with his blood. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's his church. And so we want to we get in line with him. So without further ado, the vision for our church, give, Jesus gives it to us in the passage that Scott read for us a few moments ago in John chapter 10. And I ended with this passage last week, if you were here. John chapter 10 and verse 10. Really just the last sentence of it. But it says, verse 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And listen to this. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That last sentence is a vision statement from Jesus himself. I came. This is what I want for you This is what I came that you should have, life and abundant life. Another translation says, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly, more abundantly. Definition for this abundantly means to exceed some number or measure in rank or need, over and above, more than is necessary, super added, some, uh, something further, more, much more than all, more plainly, superior, extraordinary, surpassing, uncommon, preeminent, superiority, advantage, more imminent, more remarkable, more excellent. Maybe the most widely read commentator in history, because it's by virtue of how available it is, his name is Matthew Henry, and um, went talking about this term more abundantly that we see in John chapter 10 and verse 10. He points out that it is comparative. It's comparing one way of life to another way of life that they may have life more abundantly and that which was lost and forfeited by sin more abundant than that which was promised in the law of Moses or in length of days in Canaan, more abundant than could have been expected, more than we are able to ask or even think. Christ came to give life and give it to us more abundantly with an advantage that in Christ we might not only live, but live comfortably, plentifully, and live in rejoicing. Life in abundance is eternal life, life without death or fear of death, life much more. So the repeated theme that you get here is the word more. Years ago, um, I, was, uh, I was thinking about these words from John chapter 10, and I, I put to words, put to three words when he said, I've came that you should have life. And you may have it more abundantly. Just three words that I use, and the words are live for more. Live for more. And this was, I guess, over, you know, over 20 years ago, my hair was longer and my spirit was much more flighty. And the ideas that I had of Jesus upon really beginning to embrace who he was were mostly revolutionary. That, and, and still are. That Jesus comes to change everything about us. That he doesn't, he doesn't give us some little category in our life but he wants all of it and he wants to revolutionize all of it and he wants to change all of our life and he wants to ring us out for his glory and us to be used up for him. And it's the greatest life that there is. So, but growing up in the South, I'd heard the good news that Jesus Christ had died and rose again. And I'd heard, and 
rightly so, that believing in um, Jesus, death on me for the cross, and come back from the dead, was the difference between heaven, heaven and hell. I, I didn't really need to even go to church to that. There was enough events and stuff around that you could, you could kind of get that. And so I was like, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to go to hell anymore than anybody else does. So if you'd ask me, you're like, yeah, I mean, sure, I, I believe that. I knew about him, but I, I didn't really know him. And what I didn't get, again, was that right now sort of change. That he wants everything. That he wants me to live. That the word for live is just a standard, it's just a regular old word for live, like every aspect of life. He wants us to live for more. For me, by age about 23, uh, I'd taken a sort of uh, Solomon in Ecclesiastes approach to life. And um, just whatever it is, just, you know, do as much of it if, if, you know, that you'd like. And I didn't have a lot of, a ton of parameters that were set for me or a lot of restrictions on life. I thought that was free. If you ask me to say, I get to live free to do whatever. But what I found was that living in what was supposed to bring life was actually killing me and hurting the people around me, and that everything that the world continued to promise would satisfy turned out not only to satisfy, but also make me and my friends sick, all right? That we're sickening our souls, that our lives are being wasted, and God was revealing these things to me, and all of the pleasures of the world, and there are, like, let's not, let's not deny that there is pleasure in the world, all of the pleasures of the world were a lot like a bite of cotton candy that I got at the circus when I was about eight, that you, you, you get that and it tastes so good and then it is gone. You don't, even, you don't even get to chew it. It's gone. So fleeting. So fast. No nourishment. There's another part of that. There's no nourishment in there. There's no way to sustain life with those kinds of pleasures. Uh, and then when I, through a very long series of events that I won't, I won't go through, uh, finding myself at the end of myself, which wasn't really hard to find when you're me, there is, there's Jesus saying, are you ready to... Are you ready to live for more? Are you ready to live for something different than what you thought life was really all about? Now, I got to tell you that it wasn't just John 10, 10 that taught me this. That Jesus said, I came to have, that I came that they should have life and have it more abundantly. That's where it started. But um, also there was John Piper, C.S. Lewis, and a band called Switchfoot. Okay. So the early 2000s, it was a, it was a different time. I think I got a picture. Look at these. Handsome fellas right here. I think I tried to find an older picture of what they looked like around the time that I was listening to them. Switchfoot was unique to me because they were Christian music and they were good. So when I, all right, when I came, when I came into, and I mean, I've known music a long time. I love music, all kinds of different music. And you can't tell me something is good when it's not. If there's a snobbish part of me, it's in the music category. I'm like, you could tell me all day that this is good. And if it's not good, I'm like, no, it's really not. No, but it's not. I understand that the words are good, but this is not good. Like, you know, God is a God of order. And so these strings are supposed to be played. Anyway, so back then you could go to like a Christian bookstore and they would have these things and say like, if you like Van Halen, then you'll like, and they would have like an alternative to what I'm putting on like, that ain't Van Halen. Like, I don't know what that is, and I don't like it. And so, but then, among all of the, a, a sea of these types of presentations, there was Switchfoot. And uh, Switchfoot was actually on the radio stations that I'd prior listened to. And, um, and, I'm lit, and now I'm starting, like, their stuff's making more sense, you know? And um, like I said, John 10.10 was there. But also these, these lyrics, I'm going to read these to you. say, we were meant to live for so much more. Have we lost ourselves? Somewhere we live inside. It says, they said, we want more than this world's got to offer. We want more than the wars of our fathers. And everything inside screams for second life. We were meant to live for so much more. We were meant to live for so much more. And I'm going, yes, yes, something, something in our souls that we try to like, like, no, 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 just keep doing the stuff. Just keep doing the things that everybody says you're supposed to do and climbing the ladders. Just keep doing all the things. Get on that treadmill. Go, 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 go. But then something in us is going, really, though? And then they're speaking to that. Were we meant to live for something more than this world's got to offer? If there's nothing in this world that satisfies me and I've got this appetite that's going unsatisfied, why did God make me with this appetite? Because there's a food for it, and it's in the bread of life in Jesus Christ. That is the only place where we can truly live for more. John Piper, at that time, um, he had a book that... Um, in a book that I read called Don't Waste Your Life. And it talked about one of the, one of like the most famous illustrations in there was talking about um, people in, um, 
that were recorded in, in uh, Reader's Digest. It was a couple that ended, they, they talked about their life and the success of their life, and at the end of they collected some seashells on the beach. And he said, really? We're going to stand before God one day and say, look at my shells. That was success? Was that really it? And so he said we could have a different aim for our life. John Piper called himself a Christian hedonist. Now, I didn't have a very wide vocabulary at, the, at that point, so it didn't really bother me that he said hedonist. But for a lot of people, that makes them feel a little uneasy because hedonist means pleasure-seeking, pleasure-seeking above all else. But the way John Piper used that was that he said that the greatest pleasure ever possible was found in Jesus Christ. So he didn't mind saying, I'm, I'm a Christian hedonist. I'm, I'm going all in to Jesus Christ because that's where the real pleasure of life is found. His most famous quote is that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. This has got to be true. And Pastor John quoted C.S. Lewis. If I did not know who that was, C.S. sounded like somebody my grandfather would have hung out with or something. You know, like, fix your, oh, call C.S., he'll fix your screen door. Whatever, just like, like a around-the-town handyman kind of name. But, okay, well, C.S., all right, you know, it must be from Hunt County or something. I read this and didn't know who he was. It says this. It says, um, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. He said, we're like ignorant children who want to go on making mud pies in a slum because we cannot imagine what is meant to be offered a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So what C.S. Lewis is pointing out there is we're a people without vision. We can't see it. We can't see that Jesus has offered us life more abundantly to live for more. Um, then, so you got the, you got the, the Bible. And you got John Piper, Switchfoot, C.S. Lewis. Then you start reading the Bible and you start seeing this live for more vision all over the place in the scriptures. In Psalm 16, 11, God just comes right out. It says, you make known to me the paths of life and in your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. It's either true or it's not, y'all. That there is fullness of joy in him and there are pleasures forevermore in him. 1 Corinthians 2 9 says, What no eye has seen and what no ear has heard, nor the heart of a man can even imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Psalm 23, all that about being green pastures and still waters and, and fearing no evil. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm, I, you are with me and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It, um, that uh, um, surely, I will, surely goodness and mercy shall uh, dwell with me all the days of my life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All of that is saying that, that in him there's a, there's a way to live for more. Psalm 1 says, like being a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. That's talking about a tree that never goes rotten. It's always green. It's a live for more statement. It's saying there is a life more abundantly found in, in him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things, all this other peddling around you're doing, all those things can be added unto you. Um, he that did not spare his own son, will he not graciously give us all things? Uh, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust decay but, or in thieves rush in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where is a whole lot better? It's a comparative statement saying there's something better to live for. There's something more. You, you need to live for this more. The bread of life, the living water, the way, the truth, and the life, those are all emphasis that Jesus is saying, it's in me, it's in me. I'm, I'm where you need to live. This is where real life is. But the context of the verse here in, in John 10, it gives us a great pinpoint idea of what Jesus lived for more vision is for us. And I want to look at that. So um, back in verse seven, right before John 10, 10, this didn't just verse, this didn't come out of nowhere and wind up on a coffee cup. Verse seven. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you should have life and have it abundantly. So he says he's the door. We've talked about this before. He's the door. He's the doorway. He's the doorway into ultimate pleasure. He's the doorway into God's safety and rest. He's the doorway into real life. And there are really only two choices of doors. There's Jesus, and then there's everything else. So um, Psalm 16, 25 said, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. 
You and I can sit here and try to redefine what God says all that we want, but it will not change the fact that Jesus said, I am the door. And in me, you're going to find pasture. Or in Matthew 7, 13, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. C.S. Lewis said, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from him because it is not there. It's not God trying to be ultra exclusive and uh, trying to just be um, practiced like us four and no more. That's not what's happening. He's just telling you the truth. There is no happiness. There's no true lasting joy. There's no peace. There's no protection. Life is not meant to be lived outside of him. So he, in truth and in love, tells us, I'm the door. You're the sheep. I'm the door. He's who made us. He's who died for us. He killed death and destruction for us. And he says, come inside. I got a picture. I think this came out of a children's Bible probably or something. But it's a, it's a sheep pen. Um, sorry, it's pixelated. I've showed you all this before. It's been a few years. But um, I love this, this picture uh, because Jesus said, I am the door. And if you notice in this picture, again, this is a, this is a sheep fold or a sheep pen. And after a day of pasturing and, and you know, being out, they would, they would bring the sheep back to this pen and you can see the fortified walls around them. But then you said, Jesus, Jesus said, I'm the door. And if you notice in this picture, what's, what's great about it is that you get to see there's actually a human in the door there. He is literally the door. Listen, you're in the, you get in the door, nothing's coming in to you that he don't let in. You get, in, you get inside his safety and in his side, in, in his, inside his protection, you start living in him. You can take every bit of life that comes at you knowing that he, nothing got to you except it came through the door. That means crazy. All things can work together for good for those who love the Lord and call according to his purpose. He's the door. I feel real good about him being at the door. I feel really, really good about the one who died for me and came back from the dead and is over all things and upholds the universe by the word of his power, I feel really good about him standing at the door of my life Amen. and protecting me. Amen. So um, he said everything else is, everyone else is a thief and a robber. Now in context, that would have been talking about the Pharisees who had kind of led this system of religiosity. Again, probably slick presentation, sounds really believable. We love a good works-based thing that says somebody patting us on the back going, you're doing good. And that's what people were buying into. But they were thieves and they were robbers and they, they were in it for themselves. They weren't, they weren't for the people and they weren't for God. They were, they were propagating a system that belonged to them. And so he said they were thieves and they're robbers. But I want to tell you there's lots of thieves and lots of robbers there's lots of things that you can put in the place of the door of your life. And that is what your, like your ultimate thing. Like what could happen to you right now that you would go, my life is worthless because I lost this. That's, that's who's functionally living as your door. The one who you put your confidence in. Whatever you choose as your door is your refuge, your identity, your place of safety. And it, if it is not Jesus, it will not hold you up. Um, worse than that, it will take from you, according to God's word. It will rob you of your life. And ultimately, the goal is to kill and destroy. So you can love your sin, but it is never going to love you back. Uh, or whatever your confidence is, whatever that door is. If it's, it doesn't have to be a sin. It doesn't have to be. It could be something good that you've made into a God. It can be your career. It can be your family. It could be your spouse. It could be your kids. It could be your success. We're in an election year. A lot of people are going to worship at the altar of politics like crazy over the next year. And then they may, it may or may not go the way that you want it to. And depending on whether or not it does, some things will likely change one way or another. But it is never going to change your soul. It is never going to change the most important thing about you and I. Only Jesus Christ can do that. And that's why he can say things like, I came. I'm the one who offers life. I'm the one who offers life and more abundantly. Jesus says, I'm the one who can say to you, you, you can. Like, this can actually happen. I could live for something more. So um, when he says he's the door, he, said he, he refers to us as the sheep. And if y'all been in Bible studies at all, usually when we talk about sheep, we talk about how dumb they are. And we're like, yeah, we're so dumb. <laughs> I, I, and I, I mean, we are dumb, like, or I am anyway. But I don't think that's necessarily the point of what's going on here. I don't think Jesus threw this in here to make us feel dumb. Um, but rather, maybe to make us feel vulnerable. That, like, a sheep, according to scriptures, and anybody knows, can recognize the voice of a shepherd. They were completely stupid. 
So he says, you and I need to recognize the voice of the shepherd. A sheep also during this time was very valuable. And when they were healthy, they, they produced. They had a capacity, this represents our capacity to glorify God and bless the world around us. You know, you can make that your life. You can have a reason to get out of bed every morning if it's for the glory of God and the good of others. You know why, you're, you know why your life is so draining and so hard? Because we live it for ourselves. And we get out of bed thinking of ourselves. And, a, and, a, and a, a person who just wants more for their self, there's never enough, so we always go to bed hungry, you know? But if, but if, but if, but if we have, if we're producing in our life like a healthy sheep does wool because we have a really good shepherd, then we can bless the world around us. And all of a sudden, the economy begins to change of our life. And we begin to think about how, how we can be that. Sheep are also prone to wonder. We need to know that. Because a sheep outside of a shepherd is a, a, is a meal, it's lunch for whatever predator may come along. They don't have a defense mechanism. So we need to know from this illustration that Jesus has given us that we are, in other word, defenseless. Defenseless. He's our means for survival. He's our avenue to real life. And the worst part of, the worst part of having your life robbed away from you or the worst instance of our life being robbed, the worst instance of being killed is when you don't know it. It's when it's, it is subtle enough that it's like, it's like spiritual death by paper cut, and it just keeps happening. And then you look up, and all of a sudden, you're anemic, right? We don't have that concern when we get in Christ. And, and that's, what this, that's what this means. Give me that picture back up here again real quick. So um, the most common description, you know what the most common description of a follower of Jesus Christ is in the entire New Testament? It's not disciple. It's not follower. It is in Christ, 164 times in Paul's epistles alone, you find the term in Christ, in the Lord, in him. Uh, you and I have to get this. We, this is that thing where Jesus is not an insurance policy that you cash in on when you die, but rather someone that you lose yourself in today, right now. That's where life is, in Christ. Uh, and I love the picture because it have this idea of being in him. Resting, as I said, I got nothing to worry about. Rest in his protection uh, from, from, from all. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. First Peter 5, 7. He, you're in his protection. Um, trusting in his parameters. How about this? This is a big one. So you look, look at this and imagine it's dark. Okay? It's nighttime and you've got the sheep that are in here what do you think about a sheep just hurdling this little rock fence here and taking off out into the night? That is exactly what we do when we look at the commandments of God that he has clearly stated for us and says, do not do these things. We go, we go running off into the night and we make ourselves vulnerable in ways that are completely unnecessary. Y'all, God's parameters for our life, they're not, they're not to take our life. They're not to take away from us. They're to give us life. They're, they're, uh, again, his parameters are an extension of his protection. We're, in, we're enjoying he, his protection, his parameters, his, his providence, his person. Like, you're not just knowing about him, which is, again, one of the greatest, you know, pitfalls we can fall into is we know a whole bunch of facts about this God. And then people ask you, do you really believe he exists? And you're like, if you know him, that's such a crazy question. We're so far beyond whether or not he exists. He's, he's my friend. He's my heavenly father. I, I, I have a relationship with him, not just knowing things about him, belonging to his people that God didn't, God didn't, uh, it's not a, it's not a, a, a sheep fold or a sheep pen with just me and him at the door. There's people in there with us. Don't, don't devalue that. There was, there was the, uh, the sheep know the shepherd and the sheep have each other and they stay close. We have that in this in Christ understanding and then living out his purpose you know, I think we're just, I look around the world, we're, we're like so bored. Everybody's so bored. Entertainment's terrible. And we keep acting like it's good. Oh, it was so, this movie was wonderful. No, it wasn't. It was trash. It was garbage. Uh, it wasn't even any good. We're just acting because we just keep, we got more and more and more and more bad entertainment because there's no substance to our life because we don't know the eternal one who nourishes our soul. So you and I, again, we need that. We all need a, man, we need a purpose. God made us for that. Uh, that he's put eternity in our hearts. You know that? 
Ecclesiastes 3.11. God has put eternity in the hearts of man. You bear his image. You're made for his glory. All of this, all of this is um, helping people live for more. Uh, this, is just a, this is just a mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ. It's just a, being in him is another word for disciple. And, and for me, uh, you know, I, I think it's been, it's been something that's been a, a part of my thinking for a long time, again, from, from the Lord, but from his word and then from other, to just be thinking about how can I live for more and how can I help other people do the same. And, and when I put the definition of live for more in the context of it happens in him, it's not up to me to decide what that is, but it's been given to me in God's holy word and by his spirit and abiding in Jesus Christ. We also have three words when we talk about making disciples at Grace Bible Fellowship. We've used these for, I don't know, over a decade now. But these three words are connect, and connect, connect in Christ, grow in Christ, and serve in Christ. That um, this is not, these, you know, not the end-all, be-all, but these are ways that we feel like we can keep a pulse for what's going on in the lives of people. How do we, how do we help them live for more? How do we help them connect and grow and serve? Uh, and it all happens in the context of Jesus Christ. This is how we're becoming and growing and becoming uh, more of, of his disciples that we need to be. So think about this. Uh, think about the, uh, the Wright brothers, okay? The guys who were credited with the first flight. And um, imagine if they saw the possibility of flight, but they just like, well, wow, daddy, that's a fun toy. And then they just moved on. How much of how much of your of your of your life I don't know of your vacations of of your business travel everything would be impacted assuming that other everybody else dropped the same ball and we're just we never did accomplish air travel because these two brothers didn't catch the vision and made it a passion and said we must do this and 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 be, learn how to fly how tragic would that be uh, it would be. But I want to tell you that it would be exponentially more tragic for us not to catch the vision that Jesus gives us, but Jesus died for, that Jesus bought for us. You know, the problem is with the church, with the church and I mean the people, is that we are, and it's not just church, it's, it's all of life, but it sh- the church shouldn't do this, but we become accustomed to living a certain way and being comfortable and familiar- familiarity becomes this sort of God. And we just want everything to be like you kind of maybe just want me to tell you what you want to hear. And it feels really good. Just tell me what I tell me. Just tell me the same things I'm already doing. And Jesus won't do that. Jesus won't do that. He, he keeps calling us to live for more. He keeps calling us out of those, of those comforts. And if we won't do that, we'll end up trying, weirdly enough, we end up trying to live the Christian life, but apart from Jesus, it's crazy. We just get like this set of principles or tenets or something that we, that we try to live by, but we don't know him. We don't have a relationship with him. I had a, I had a buddy that used to, when I saw him, he would say, you know, sometimes like, you say you've been getting in your word or, this thing, you've been going to Bible study. You know, those are good questions to ask. This buddy, he was a pastor. He used to ask me, are you living the adventure? I'm like, what the crud does that mean? Am I living the adventure? And it took me a while to, to realize that's exactly what this life is. That's exactly what life in Christ is. Read, his, read, read the Bible. Read, read about the people that hung around with Jesus. And read about the stuff that, they got, that, they, that he got them into. You got people around you right now that you're afraid to have uncomfortable conversations with. Well, you know you need to because you need to know where they are in the Lord. You have an area of your life that you have reserved for your glory. And you need to think about what does it look like for you to glorify God in that area of life. I'm not telling you something that you're begrudgingly going to go into. I'm telling you where life is, y'all. It's where Jesus has life for us. So in, in our church, um, I want us to think about how we can live for more. Q, I want you to help our students to, to live for more. Not just behave. You know, we, I know we want our kids to behave. I know we want our students to, but I used to say, I used to always hear, well, can you get them to act right? Well, 
I'd rather see them live for more. I'd rather see them know Jesus and, and passionately pursue him and have their lives changed. And so volunteer youth workers, when you're looking at those students, man, know that, that God, has a, God has a vision for them to live for more. Ashley Kane, she's our children's director. She's pouring into students, little kids right now, and Grace Kids and Impact. We need to think about how we look at those children and inspire them to live for more, live life in Jesus Christ. So our, like our, our Connect team, people that, that greeted y'all when you came in here, they're not just helping people find a seat. The, the, the idea is that we welcome others as Christ has welcomed us, and we're the face and the handshake that greets them with the desire to live for more in Jesus Christ. Tina, in our, in our women's ministry, we're, we're not just gathering ladies for a, for a time to talk and, and maybe uh, get some more facts about the Bible. That's not what those ladies are doing. They're learning how they can live for more. They're wanting to encounter Jesus in these studies. In our, our men's ministry, it's, it's not hard to figure out what, what men like to do. And so, yeah, we can, we can get, to, get together and kill stuff and eat it and catch things. And, you know, I love that. I love those kinds of things. But it is, it, it is a far cry short of getting together in the name of Jesus and knowing how to lead our families the way God would have us to, to lead and live for more. I want us to, you know, Wes and our grace group leaders, like, great, you want me to have some people over to our house and sit in the living room and maybe even open a Bible. What if we just thought about these as places to get fueled up to change the world for Jesus, to encounter Jesus and help other people do the same, to live real life, to know what real, to, I don't know what real life is. I got I to gotta have Jesus for that. I got to know him deeper. I got to know him more. That's where... I, I, my prayer in, in preaching from this stage is that every Sunday that I, I would be able to inspire people to, by God's grace, lead them more. That's what Jesus envisions for us. So we can't settle. We can't settle. Our communities don't need us to settle. N no, nobody else is going to steward this message but God's people in Jesus Christ. All right? You and I have a purpose. We have a need. I told you all uh, that I have three things that that are like stylistic things, or I didn't say three, but I do. I have three things stylistically that kind of come, come with your pastor. Uh, and y'all can get rid of me. You really can. I mean, was, you know, you can still make disciples without me here, and that's, that's part of the glory of, of Jesus Christ. But um, years ago when I, when I uh, became a vocational minister, I was, I was, uh, I was up for um, election. I, I really don't know what it is, but in the church I was at, they had to vote. Like, like you put about, about 500 people would vote on whether or not they wanted you to be at the church. And so they, I had to stand up there, and I was like, this is like the worst game of Survivor I've ever heard of in my life. They're going to vote me onto the island, or they're going to vote me out right here. And, I just, and you've got like, I don't know, a little bit of time. Don't talk long. They won't vote for you. And don't talk too short, or they won't vote for you. And so what do I say? And so I asked the pastor, I said, what do you think I should say? And I'd already asked him. I was like, because we'd already been through like 17 interviews or whatever. I was like, when do you think I can give my two weeks notice to my current job and he goes not until they vote <laughs> I was like oh crud this thing's real you know I said what do you think I should say and he goes well something you've said in, in the interview process several times he said I think you should say that and I didn't I didn't even need to ask him what the three things were uh, because I knew what they were and, they, and these things are still very important to to me and I hope you see these things in this church that we are biblical that we're relational and that we have fun all right now the first two most church people are not going to argue with all right Nobody's going to say, how dare you? Well, somebody might say, how dare you be biblical, but it would probably be about a, you know, like a particular Bible thing. Most people, that's just like, yep, that's the way it is. We use the Bible. And, and, and something called a Bible church, that probably shouldn't surprise you. Okay, Grace Bible Fellowship. Again, fellowship is in the name, so you probably shouldn't be surprised by the fact that we're going to be in relationships. There's like 35 plus one another's in the scripture that we need to be fulfilling and for our good and for God's glory relationships. But what about the fun? Huh? Does that weird you all out? Because if it does, this might be a hard place. Uh, as long, unless y'all get rid of me, which maybe there's a vote out program. I don't know. Y'all could do that. Uh, years ago, we were without a youth pastor. I had been the youth pastor, and, and um, I was in a training program, and I had all these top-notch dudes in this program with me. And a lot of them were looking for jobs in ministry, and I was like, surely I'm going to get somebody to come be the youth pastor of this church from this program over here. And I had this dude named Josh. I loved Josh. Just a good dude. And I was like, oh, man, God, let's, let's work it out. So we, we sat down over a series of conversations talking to him. And I said, well, you know, Josh, the universal language of, of students and really of people is, is fun. And he said, uh, you know, 
there's the Bible and then there's fun. And I remember he put his hands up like this. There's the Bible and there's fun. But these two things don't go together. And I said, Josh, I love you very much, but you probably ain't going to make it over here, bud. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon said that there are, nearness to God should have three things. It should have holiness. It should have, what's my second one? Holiness, humbleness, humility. Holiness, humility, and the third one, happiness. Happiness. What in the world do we not have to be joyful about? Why in the world we should have the market cornered on the best kind of fun that there is? Fun that happens in Jesus Christ. Keep would y'all go ahead and come on back up. And if y'all would please stand. And bow your heads with me and let's, uh, let's join our hearts together and, and go to the Lord. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, don't stop in us till you got every ounce of us. Don't let us hide from you. Let us be found in you. God, I pray that you would do with this church what you want to do. Get us out of the way. But still use us. Let it be bigger than us. And God, by your grace, if you would, please let it include us. We love you. We want to love you more. And we need you. In your beautiful name we pray, Jesus. Amen.